Okay, welcome to session seven. This is on astrology, very loosely. This is technically considered astrotheology, being that there is a strong belief that all the major religions of the world are in fact rooted in worship around the stars. This is something that we can find across many cultures. This is, uh, I will be elaborating on this today, but it's an important topic to me personally. Uh, this is something that I focused a lot on in my undergraduate years, uh, specifically on the mixed relationship of astrology inside of Christianity, um, the what's and the why's and the where's in scripture. Uh, and historically speaking, astrology has been a topic of fascination for me since I was a teenager, not necessarily in how it's been made out in the modern day, but more in what it was historically um, and how we can use it to understand where we come from ancestrally. Um, regardless of what we think about astrology, it was of the utmost importance to our ancestors of practically, no, I will say every culture of the ancient world. Um, the common impression of what astrology is, is essentially a pseudoscience, um, as it's been claimed under the general belief of science and scientism. Uh, However, it seems that the reformation undertaken by Christianity and then later the birth of rationalism and science from Christianity would immediately give a bad rap to astrology. Um, on the uh, YouTube channel that I post all these talks to, uh, there is a talk on the history of astrology that goes over this. This is something that I've discussed before, but today... I want to specifically discuss more of, uh, first, for one, how it underlies um, our history and Christianity and Judaism. And also, I want to, I hopefully uh, want to have some time to discuss the philosophical implications of believing in astrology and um, how this discussion has permeated the thought. Uh, of human history in regards to free will and fatalism. So with that introduction out of the way, uh, we should begin to understand how the ancients looked at astrology by, by saying that they began religion by anthropomorphizing the seasons illustrated by the constellations. So, to look up in the sky and to realize that the stars hold relevance to the passing seasons. And accordingly, you give these constellations uh, characteristics. You anthropomorphize them, um, whether they are represented by animal or by a type of archetypal figure. So, uh, the zodiac or the zodiacos kyklos as it was created or nurtured by the greeks was one of the first conceptual symbols of the ancient world specifically the western world um, so to have the wheel and to have the sun in the middle was one of these first signs of very abstract thought now before i go much further we have to give credit um, to the fact that if you can imagine all of us as a human society are put at ground zero you know we're back to hunter gatherer times a very minimal minimal civilization and we all come together in some way the ancient past comes together in some way to be able to categorize and divide and name and understand the moving wheel of the stars in the sky. This is not just a great 
uh, navigational feat, but the very effort shows a fervent dedication to understanding the stars, a, a fundamental fascination with what the stars are, what they do. Um, so we can start by uh, understanding this by looking at Aquarius. Now, many people think Aquarius is a water sign, but uh, it's actually an air sign, but we're not going to get into these technicalities. But Aquarius is referred to as the water bearer. And this is the time of the year where the spring rains begin, or they did begin, um, based off the people who was naming these names, the Greeks gave this name. So the water bearer is the time of the year where the rain comes. In ancient Egypt, we have Horus, which is the big deal of ancient Egypt. Um, everything that Horus does, mind you, Horus is a sun god. Everything that he does in this lore, in this uh, myth mythology, is a metaphor for the sun's movements. Uh, if you read through these old myths, you're seeing a personification of what the sun does in the sky. There is no difference between the god and the sun. What is happening in space is the god. Um, thus, why the planets are named after Greek gods. <laughs> uh, so in Egyptian, it was always about Horus versus Set, or sunrise versus sunset, and light versus dark. This theme is uh, completely intertwined in our uh, history. I mean, every uh, all of our stories are intertwined in this duality and our concepts and abstractions and mentalities are are based off of this polarity this dualism between light and dark or sunrise and sunset this is by no means the beginning or end of how many similarities there are between christianity and the myths of egyptians um similarly and i've mentioned this in the mithras talk uh mithras krishna Dionysus and Addis of Greece all have these same conditions of birth and resurrection of, of varying degrees. So this is the astrotheological understanding of this. The star in the east is Sirius. On December 25th, Sirius aligns with the belt of Orion. So they line up. And these three stars of the belt of Orion are known as the three kings or the three wise men, whatever the verbiage is as it changes throughout time. Now, uh, this is why the three kings follow the star in the east in order to find the sun. So when I say sun, this is an intentional pun. It is S-O-N and S-U-N, the same, sun, sun. This is the birth of the sun. So uh, to understand this, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go into it later, actually. I'll, I'll give some more context. But I want to take this time right now to talk about the star Sirius in particular. Now, the Yoruba believed that their gods, or they, originated from a planet near Sirius. Uh, the Egyptians centered their religion and, and the building of their uh, certain parts of their pyramids around Sirius. Uh, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, much in the same way. The Native American tribe, the Cheyenne, uh, have a story about a woman, a woman who married the morning star and gave birth to a star hero. Uh, the Blackfoot have many myths surrounding the morning star. It's, a, it's an integral part of their mythos. Um, in Chaldea, this uh, star was known as the dog star or the star that leads. Uh, in China, it was referred to as the heavenly wolf. So there's this uh, strange um, thing in, in throughout ancient cultures of referring to Sirius by the name of a dog or a wolf. In Akkadian, it's the dog of the sun. Um, 
the Siri, uh, I think, it, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, but another African tribe, or actually a Southwest American indigenous tribe, refers to Sirius as the dog that follows mountain sheep. And the Cherokee um, referred to it as the path of the souls. So in certain ancient beliefs and or new age beliefs, we have this concept that Sirius is a sort of gateway of the souls, that that is where our alleged souls uh, originate from, and that we uh, come from there originally and are corporealized here on Earth. Um, an extra note is the, the tribe of Nebraska, the Skeedy call it the Wolf Star and the Alaskan Inuit call it the Moon Dog. So, um, where do I wanna go with this next? This is not just important for the natives. It's not just important for the ancient Western world. It's important for uh, the Eastern cultures and the Polynesians in different ways. Um, so Sirius, will be found in some capacity no matter where you are in the ancient world. Um, you will always find different stories of Sirius, whether we're going to take this as literally as these kind of ancient astronomers do, where they believe that Sirius is the home of extraterrestrials that intervened with the human race, or whether Sirius is simply a star that is anthropomorphized or talked about in ancient stories. It is always a point of importance. So to get back on track and to start talking about uh, where I was at before, uh, you know, the three kings following the, the sun, the birth of the sun, um, the Virgin Mary is a representation of Virgo which means virgin. The astrological symbol for Virgo is a kind of stylized M, um, which would result in Virgin Mary or Buddha's mother being the Virgin Maya or Addis's of Greece's mother, Myra. Um, Virgo is often depicted as a um, virgin holding a basket of bread. And if we look at the Hebrew translation of the name Bethlehem, this translates to the house of bread. So where Jesus is allegedly born is in the house of bread in Bethlehem. It's not necessarily a place. It's more of a constellation. The winter solstice is the birth of the sun that has been previously viewed to be dying. So on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun, if we're watching it, uh, is appearing static. It's not moving. So prior to this, the sun keeps moving down and the days keep getting shorter and shorter. But on these three days, the sun is understood as dead because the sun appears to not move. And only after the three days on the 25th, the sun moves one degree up, which is viewed as the birth because now the days will start to return longer than the nights. So this is the astrotheological understanding of why so many ancient cultures have this depiction of dying, the sun dying, or Mithra, or whoever dies and then is resurrected after three days because of the dates of December 22nd through the 25th. So... <clears throat> Something that I mentioned in the Mithra talk as well is that the sun died on the cross. They say the sun died on the cross, but the cross is an appropriated symbol of the astronomical symbol for the sun. It is a circle with a cross on the inside. And oftentimes when you see crosses in Christianity, you see that it's 
a, a circle is involved with the cross. And so this is uh, saying that the son died on the cross is a kind of reference to its own thing. The son died in the sun. <laughs> um, now, they would celebrate this date in the ancient past, mostly in the West. We originate this date from, we don't know exactly where, but we do see this same holiday, this same holy day um, practiced by the Sumerians and the Babylonians long before any uh, Abrahamic religion comes about. So they wouldn't have celebrated fully at this point because they still had to rough out the rest of the winter, but this was their showing of promise. They wouldn't celebrate until Easter, which was the spring equinox, which is where the light officially overcomes the dark. So the, where days are longer than nights. Now, Another trope that we need to dissect here in order to, one, understand the Bible better, and two, understand the ancient past better, is that the use of the number 12 is inexplicably, or it's just completely intertwined with the constellations. There is 12 constellations. There are 12 disciples. The sun travels with the disciples. Again, as mentioned, the cross was originally a symbol for the sun. We have 12 tribes, of, 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus was in a temple at 12. We have 12 kings of Israel. We have 12 prophets. We have 12 princes of Israel. We have 12 great patriarchs. We have 12 judges of Israel. And we have 12 brothers of Joseph. In Revelations 22, 2, the tree of life, which bears 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. <laughs> this is a direct reference to astrology. Twelve different fruits, one of these fruits every month. Different archetype ascribed to a different month. Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, pun intended, the light of the world, pun intended they see the sun coming in the clouds mark 13 26 then jesus came forth wearing a crown uh, a crown of thorns uh the crown this is john 19 5 by the way the crown is sun rays you see this in depictions of gods before jesus and after jesus um especially Mithra is a good one to look at where you see the rays going out, the, the, the crown of thorns going out. In order to understand a lot of the ancient past too, we need to speak about the procession of the equinoxes. And this is uh, an astronomical and mathematical understanding that the ancient world had all around. So we can give all this credit to modern astronomy and so forth, but really the ancients had a very sophisticated understanding of how the cosmos or the greater solar system worked. So when we see an age represented in the Bible or in the past, an age equals 2,150 years. The great year, as it was called, the great year was 25,772 years long. This is how long it takes for us at our vantage point on earth to move through all the constellations and through all the ages to return to the spot where we were at before. So the age of Taurus is about 43 uh, 4,300 or 4,300 BC to 2,150 BC. This is the age of Taurus. In the cult of Mithras, uh, Mithras is shown killing the bull or the god of time or, uh, you know, basically uh, doing the depictions that we see in, in contemporary bullfights 
<laughs> um, in order to move humanity from the age of Taurus into the age of the Ram. Oh, gosh, I mean, this stuff is rich, folks. From 2150 to the year 1 AD, this was the age of the Ram or Aries. Again, this is the procession of the equinoxes. So each of these time slots in human history is categorized by the archetype ascribed to that constellation. So what humanity is going through on a collective consciousness level is affected or viewed, has been historically viewed to be affected by what age we're in. So the age of Pisces is from the year one until 2150 AD. So a lot of people, you might have heard several times over, and this really came out in the 70s, that we have entered the age of Aquarius, or many people said that um, 2012 was the official cusp into the age of Aquarius. However, this isn't true. We are much closer to the age of Aquarius than we are to the age of the Ram. We are definitely in the latter part of the age of Pisces, um, but we're not quite in full form age of Aquarius yet. So I want to get into that later. I hope, uh, I hope I remember to do so. It's really easy to get lost in this talk because honestly, there's way too much of this and there's no way I could cover this in an hour. This is just to kind of give the platter. So Moses comes down with his commandments, right? And he sees people worshiping a bull and he reacts with anger. Uh, I can't remember how he, t- how he says, he either tells them to kill each other or to kill themselves um, because he represents the changing of the new age into the age of the ram. And they're still worshiping or are symbolized to be worshiping the bull or Taurus. As I mentioned, Mithras kills the bull. So here's another tradition talking about this ancient understanding of the transition of the age. So with this association with the age of Pisces in Jesus marking this new age, we can understand why uh, there are all these bumper stickers that have the name of Jesus inside of a fish or why, and I've mentioned this before too, why the Pope wears a fish hat. Um, Gosh. Uh, A quote from the Bible. um, We have only five loaves of bread. Virgo, and two fish, how they were all fed on two fish, a reference to Pisces representing two fish. Um, I'm not going to get into this as much, but it's something I mentioned at the beginning. We have many contradictory quotes from the Bible about astrology. Um, My quickest way to sum this up is why we find all these, uh, all this scripture that makes astrology into the work of heathens, I believe the simplest way to put this is because they wanted to distance themselves from the worshiping of the specific planets. They wanted to make it about one, right? The the highest up. And so since astrology at this point in history was tied uh, to the worshiping of the gods, which were the planets, Uh, embodying them, making sacrifices to them, performing rituals uh, with their names. This is why astrology was kind of demonized by the church, yet it is also inexplicably tied to astrology and owes its scripture to astrology, but it's hidden underneath the surface. It's more of an esoteric understanding and not an exoteric understanding. So I'll give you an example of of how it goes good in the Bible. Uh, Ecclesiastics uh, 3, 1 through 8, um, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, um, so on and so forth, a time for war, a time for peace, 
um, time to love, uh, time to be silent. Uh, all of this is a, a very interesting reference to astrology because that's what it was about. As it started, it was all about omens. Uh, an early Sumerian king, a Gidea of Lagash, uh, had a dream uh, of consulting with the gods about what was the right time to build a temple. This goes all the way into the past where they have to reference the stars as to when are good times to do things. So the Egyptians or anybody else for that matter would want to know if the Nile was going to flood so that they could harvest their crops ahead of times so that they wouldn't starve. Uh, this is something that I could get into much more, but we're going to move through. Genesis 1, 14 through 15. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the light and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky and give light on the earth. And so it was so. Astrologically speaking, certain signs are cardinal signs, which show the beginning of a season. Certain signs are fixed signs, which means that they are the middle of the seasons. And certain signs are mutable signs, which make them the ending of seasons. In the Bible, Jesus was asked where the next Passover will be. And in Luke 22.10, he says, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall be a man to meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth. So Jesus is saying in the next age will be Aquarius, a man who bears a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house. House is another term for constellation. Again, we need an esoteric, we need a, a, a level of understanding to see what's really going on here. We can't just read it at the surface and think that it's just overly abstract. So astrology was a foundational knowledge to uh, the Norse, the Druids, uh, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Zoroastrian, and the Zoroastrians, the Mithraisms or the Mithraics, the Mayans, the Aztecs, uh, the Native Americans. Um, and in more subtle ways, it's involved in all Abrahamic religions, Hinduism, Taoism, and Buddhism. For instance, in Hinduism, uh, Ganesh, the, uh, it's the one that most people recognize because it's the elephant god. Uh, he represents the spirit of Jupiter. And this is translated as the Lord of Hosts. The Lord of Hosts is one of the favorite titles of Jehovah in the Old Testament. The Lord of Hosts being a direct reference, when you hear it, to Jupiter. Being the big boy, or Zeus, or, you know, the greatest of all the gods, the planets. In the modern day... And we'll back this up a bit, but in the modern day, uh, Einstein, Isaac Newton, Carl Jung, all heavily studied astrology. It was only recently that they could come out and talk about it because it was heathen, hedonistic. Uh, it was forbidden to look into astrology. Even Jung was very tiptoey about mentioning his study of astrology, but we can see it in his understanding of different psychological personality traits, most notably sensation, intuition, feeling, and thinking are translated to earth, air, water, fire. Fire is intuition. Water is sensation. Um, Feeling is air. Maybe I'm backing, maybe I'm mixing these things up a bit. I haven't studied young enough here. <laughs> but astrology of the past 
did eventually get roped into what is called paganism or polytheism. However, astrology has always been a technical science in, in its main form. So although it got caught up in what we call gods or myth, um, it was highly successful in acts of clairvoyance and, and prophecy, which philosophically we're going to have to spend some time on. Uh, it is not an art that is hidden. Anybody who wants to learn about astrology, this is around. The only times, uh, this is just me saying that it's not an occult thing. This isn't a hidden science. This is something that was a tremendous part of human history. The only time that it has been negative or been made to be secret was under the Inquisition, which is specifically tied to Christianity and science follows suit, but science won't go about killing them, <laughs> killing people for looking into it. Um, this is not an art which deems anybody with what some might call psychic gifts. This is something of a system. If this, then that. The earliest um, forms of astrology resemble the farmer's almanac, resemble uh, ephemerises. This is how people know when to plant and when not to plant and what to plant. This is something that is still used and made every year. The almanac comes out every year, yet people think astrology is, is woo-woo. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about what's going on all around us. So um, the, in Islamic sciences and uh, Arabic understanding, um, this was just, uh, always a part of their culture. It was the decree of the stars. Um, the, in Sanskrit, uh, in India, uh, they referred to it in the translation as the science of light. Um, the Chinese would study it uh, and would refer to it as the yin-yang way, how things move back and forth, light and dark. Um, There are all sorts of ways that you can make this subject much deeper than I'm going. And what I mean by that is that some researchers of astrotheology um, believe that certain religions are ascribed to certain planets. So uh, I'm forgetting the name right now, but he was a 33 degree Mason. Uh, Man, Man Hall, Manly Hall, and he believed that Judaism was tied to Saturn, that Islam was tied to Venus, and that Christianity was tied to Mars. Maybe I'm getting that wrong. So people spin this all sorts of ways. Um, however, as a historical understanding, what is, what is the fact is that Jupiter is Zeus, Venus is Aphrodite, Aries is, um, you know, the god of war, uh, Mars. This is simply the translation between the Greek names and the Roman names for the planets. So if you can imagine, it wasn't about... Mount Olympus, really, it was that they could see the spherical bodies in the skies. They realized that these spherical bodies have an effect on the world, whether that is simply that when they're at a certain place, that means that you should plant these crops so that things go better, or to the level of we are this way and my personality is this way because of these planets. It only turned into what we call horoscopic or deconic or 
personality-based astrology when it came time for the Greeks. The Greeks made astrology much more intricate and nuanced than their ancestors did. The Greek word for cosmos means world, but by the name world, it, it meant everything encapsulated by the eye. Um, there's actually a place in Athens, it's a suburb of Athens called Neos Cosmos. Um, that means new world. It's literally named the new world, <laughs> just as a, a side note here. The root of the word cosmetic, you know, cosmetology, cosmetics, is translated as beautiful order or the beautiful world or the beauty of the world. Um, so that's how you can tie cosmetics to the cosmos. Um, the cause of presence, uh, well, okay, let me back this up. There's many beliefs in ancient society, especially by the Vedas in India, that the cause of present events lie in the future. Or in other words, reality is a backwards causation. It is not about... Uh, what happened before makes what will happen in the future. It's what will happen in the future makes what happens to us now. <laughs> so like I said, there's many ways that this uh, reaches mind-bending mind -bending proportions. Uh, the Hebrews in the Old Testament made it uh, a very firm rule that you must perform the rituals on certain days. So you must perform the rituals of holidays on those holidays. And to not do so would be to invite divine wrath or bad luck or uh, terrible misfortune. Um, they, they and many other cultures took those days very, very, very seriously. They were sacred days, sacred holy, holy days. Uh, and we've really lost that root as a society as to why the holidays are holidays, why those specific days are those holidays. And the answers lie in astrology, ancient astronomy, um, ancient reverence of the order or the beauty of the cosmos. So as I mentioned before, the First Nations uh, of North America, they believed that the cosmos was a moving structure enacted, uh, and enacted uh, rituals designed to harmonize with this greater field of existence. Um, so they, it was as if you could disobey the great function of things and that would be to your misfortune and much like in shamanism which they still practiced their ultimate goal was to honor how the stars were moving so they would observe them and as a last note before i go completely awol in in my own discussions here uh the aboriginals and the polynesians before you know modern civilization reached them, they would use the stars and understood the stars as a means of navigation from getting one island to one island to another to be able to travel in the night. Still to this day, um, and I know a guy personally, uh, still to this day, you must have somebody on a, a freighter or on a ship that understands celestial navigation that understands how to follow the stars in order to get to where you need to get because in the off chance that their electrical or gps systems go down their last hope of of not being utterly and completely lost is that one guy that most of the time gets just just is paid to just sit there <laughs> would be their only hope So there is a root to all of these different disciplines of astrology. The natives of America had their own astrology. 
this was based off of animals and it's it, this is very similar to uh what we see in, in Aztec had their own astrology or the Mayans had their own astrology, which if you remember 2012 was all about this great year, you know, they're, they're apparently their, their, their big clocks ended at this point. And that's why everybody was freaking out about 2012. And that's again, why they believe that it was moving to the age of Aries or the age of Aquarius, which they thought the Mayans were calculating. Um, so here, here in the Americas, they had their own. Uh, the Druids had their own, uh, but theirs was unique because it was based off of trees and not off of animals. Um, the Chinese, they have their own, except it's based off of years. Um, and they include different elements, uh, metal and wood, as opposed to the classic elements of paganism, earth, water, uh, air, and fire. Um, and throughout the ancient world, uh, the, the astrology that we know today uh, you know, Virgo, Scorpio, uh, Sagittarius, so forth. Um, this is all inherited from the Western tradition, which has bounced around a few different ways. Uh, the, the, the big story there is that it's a, it's a mix between what came from Mesopotamia or Sumeria, moved to Egypt in a separate order, uh, made its own, and then uh, moved to Europe uh, and eventually coalesced in the Greeks. And then when Alexandria became a thing, all these different uh, astrologies mixed together. And that's what we inherit as the Western tradition horoscopic uh, zodiac. Um, so what I wanna say with this is that it's everywhere and there must be a reason why it's everywhere. So where the natives came from, However long ago, when they crossed the, uh, the land bridge uh, of Siberia to Alaska, um, or however they got there, there's you know, some other ideas, they obviously brought this with them. So the tradition of astrology must predate all civilization as we know it by our contemporary historic understanding. There are depictions in caves in France and so forth of reverence to the stars that date like 25,000 years ago. This is something that you're going to find in every religion in some form. Now, it makes perfect sense that as early humans, again, you know, imagine that we know nothing. We have no culture. We have no, uh, even necessarily a language or even, you know, any of the things that we understand as of today, you know, a car, what's that? Uh, a bookshelf, what's that? What's a book? Um, all these things just complete now. We don't have any knowledge that the world is apparently circular. We don't have any knowledge of, of anything such as this, okay? Completely open slate. Now, at night, you look up. And you see all of this, all these lights, these speckled lights. So what is this? <laughs> like, this is the original holiness. This is the original sacredness. This is the original fascination of pulling man's consciousness towards reverence. That there are tremendous things happening beyond what what is it what could it be um even the concept of us being on a planet is a little heavy-handed to talk about this early human psychology so um and what's up with the sun what is that thing uh why does it go away and then come back you know um and so logically uh, the moon and these these planets, which they started to notice were different than the stars and all of these things would be characters to them. They're, they're things that reoccurringly interact with their human experience. So they can't talk with them, but they can observe them or, you know, eventually maybe they can talk with them via oracles and so forth. But the myth, all the myth and all of the ideas and all of the names come later but the first understanding 
was um, tracking, omens, a, a mathematical pursuit. There's arguments that can be made that astrology was uh, the impetus for mathematics, was the impotence for science, was the motivation for everything that eventually bloomed, agriculture. Um, if you study as an astrologer does, then you realize that certain points of human history seem to uh, align with certain astrological uh, alignments. So for instance, when Saturn conjuncts with Jupiter, that is a tremendous time of change in the, in the history of mankind. Something changes a lot. I'm not going to remember exactly what happens, but I think things like the Renaissance or revolutions, when Pluto reaches to a certain point in its 300 something year orbit, um, it always results in revolution, social unrest, and so forth. The last time that Pluto was at this specific point was the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and so forth. All of the revolutions that went through and essentially attempted, attempted to wipe out monarchy in the ancient world. This is now, actually, it's not here yet, but it's very soon returning. So if you feel like there's a worldly kind of social unrest, an astrologer would just be like, yeah, dude, I mean, this is a part of the clock. This is as it goes on. So, okay. As a further basis to the understanding is that you as a person are the way that you are because of the first breath that you took when you came into this world. That first breath that you took is understood to be the codifying of that moment of history. You are that moment. The personality of what that moment felt like. Maybe it was a happy moment for some. Maybe it had all these elements. Maybe there was some interesting philosophical discussions going on. Maybe there was a world event that happened that day. What that day felt like, and specifically that microscopic, that minute moment of time where you took that breath is your essence, is your consciousness. The consciousness of that time is you and your personality is according to that. So that's why they study where all the stars were in order to get a gauge of who you were the moment of your birth and where you were the moment of your birth. So in this way, philosophically and historically, and it, we're talking about the woo-woo end of astrology here, we're not talking about the practical side of astrology here, that means that you are a moment in time being dragged through other moments in time. You are the representation of one movement, movement experiencing itself throughout other movements, which <laughs> is a lot to deal with, I know. Um, now, the other thing I want to touch on, too, is this big discussion in the ancient world, which has taken on many forms in philosophical traditions, in religious traditions, being the debate between free will and fatalism. So fatalism is the divine plan it, or, you know, that everything is set. It's fate, hard-nosed fate, no changing it. Okay, that's one side. Then free will, where you are unaffected. There is nothing affecting you. Um, you are utterly free to do everything that you could ever do, which I find very silly, because in which case, uh, if you can do anything that you want to do, then why don't you just uh, leap off this planet, be able to breathe air in space, uh, become the king of the world. Uh, well, actually, you know, just fly around. You don't need a, 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 a plane because <laughs> you can do anything you want to. You have free will. Um, but to say the, the opposite, that everything is co concretely, utterly decided, this has been more of the philosophy of the collective past. Um, however, like I said, this is a great debate. Now, historically, now we're talking the history of thought here. Um, free will is very much a newer concept. And what I mean by that is free will was very much introduced by Christianity in a lot of ways and was really pushed by science, much like the de uh, demonizing of astrology. So those two go uh, coincide with each other, go hand in hand. Um, and Christianity 
ascribes free will in the sense that you can be a good boy and go upstairs, or you can choose to be a bad boy and go downstairs. You know, classic Santa Claus coal or presence situation. <laughs> um, and this means that you have a choice. There aren't certain souls that are born certain ways, you know? If we believe in reincarnation, then that would be to say that some people have been around so many times that they are inherently good because they've learned the many lessons of being evil. And if we understood it in this way too, people who are evil are just simply young, not old souls, but young souls who are experimenting with the limitations and the sensations and phenomenas of corporeal existence. Um, however, uh, Christianity introduces this which also introduces an amount of fear and guilt, which would become characteristic of our era all the way into the modern day. Whole nother topic. And science would blow the lid off that. We live in an anarchic, uh, heartless uh, world, which is ran by mechanistic mathematical algorithms that gravitation is, uh, you know, this force and the, the spinning of the, the astral bodies is a blind force. There's nothing divine about it. And in which case we are introduced with existentialism, nihilism, and trying to find meaning <laughs> in the absence of any fate or any uh, leading towards higher purpose or uh, greater functioning happening in the, in the universe. Now, this is a tremendous debate. This is something that we have struggled with in the same way as we struggle with the fear of our own mortality and our uh, finite nature. Um, we, the Greeks had an understanding that the stars compel, but they do not force. So it is suggestive and it has a tendency. So the uh, act of fate is kind of this middle ground here where it's going a certain way, but you have the freedom to kind of form your own tributaries or you have the freedom to go against that. Um, but in other traditions, to go against fate is a tremendous uh, mistake. For instance, in Hinduism and inherited by Buddhism, we have the concept of dharma, which is more or less your life purpose, your, your way in life which we'll talk about this when we get to Taoism, which I've been waiting a long time to do. Um, to negate the Dharma, to uh, refuse your way of life, to refuse what you were born into, is to invite a great havoc unto the world, to punish not only yourself, but everybody around you. If you've ever watched the series Lost, <laughs> it's an old ABC show, you know, it's the Dharma Initiative. Every time they leave the, when they attempt to leave the island, they are going against their dharma and people die and things go wrong. So they always have to return and deal with their fate. This is, uh, lost is a great allegory of the way that the Sanskrit Hindu Buddhists understood dharma. Um, so again, we have some cultures here and still to this day, uh, to break your dharma is, is a huge taboo. Um, there is one culture that errs on this side that you must go with your dharma. You must go with the faith. You have the natives, again, as I mentioned before, who believe uh, in, in any shamanistic, you know, whether we're talking of the true shamans of, of Siberia or we're talking about the shamans who operate in Africa or we're talking about the shamans who do their ayahuasca ceremonies down, down in Peru and so forth, or we're talking about the shamans sprinkled all throughout the different tribes and cultures. Um, the belief is always to go with the fate, to embrace the way, to embrace what the stars have to compel you. So this is why it's been a very contentious topic in the past. Um, 
because the implications of this discussion have everything to do with why we approach life. The stars introduce an existential, uh, divine, and reverential aspect to our lives. We, um, in the scientific understanding, they make us exponentially small. We are a scrap of dust. And uh, in the other way, to kind of flip that script, uh, the stars can be viewed as guides, as, as things that were invented by us or invented by the God that created us as well, if we want to go there, to assist us. The, the Sumerians believed, and the Babylonians by inheritance believed, that the stars were here to reveal the story of mankind, that the more we looked into it, the more we would understand why we're here, and the more that we would uh, begin to understand and move towards our promised utopia, uh, that the, the stars are a kind of code placed by the Godhead uh, at the beginning of time for us to slowly unravel it as we become smarter and more conscious and more perceptible. Um, we kind of crack the code and then we're officially a utopia. We're officially reaching Christ consciousness. We're officially, you know, breaking through the fourth wall, transcending um, our, uh, you know, banal, mundane existence of uncertainty and misunderstanding. So you can see why, uh, and I know I have to bring this to a close now, you can see why I wanted to bring up this topic in so many ways, because although it's my first talk on this spiritual studies course that isn't explicitly one religion, uh, this is a discussion that speaks to all religions. All religions variate in this discussion of how to understand the stars, whether it's serious or whether it's just about our planets, uh, or you know, mentioning the constellations or the luminaries, whatever they're called in whatever traditions and however they're understood, they always play a part. And there's a reason for that. There is an inherited culture here that we don't know about. I mean, it goes beyond Proto-Indo-European. We're talking, I mean, if you're an Atlantean sort of subscriber, we're talking about that level of history, or we're talking about uh, some sort of divine understanding or uh, inherited tradition that comes all the way from our primitive era. Uh, gosh, man, there's so much unknown to be had here. But one thing I want to make very, very clear is that Vogue magazine is not okay. <laughs> it is not an accurate representation of what astrology is. For people to point to the shysters who create overly generalized uh, confirmation biased oriented horoscopes are simply doing it for viewership they are shysters um there are good astrologers in the modern day there are people who have held the craft throughout all this time of historical repression you should take them seriously you should hear them out there is a lot of technicality that goes into the understandings of astrology you have trines, you have squares, you have conjuncts, you have sextiles, you have quintiles, you have conjunctions, you have the, oh gosh, uh, you have the houses rotations, you have the natal charts, you have the calculations of the cusps, I mean, so on and so forth. The outer planets, the inner planets, the different embodiments, there is so much to be unveiled, and we stand generally as a culture blind to this nuance that we once knew very collectively and that we accepted completely. Um, so I hope this uh, can kind of break some of those taboos, reinvent that fascination that we were born with as a human society. Um, and uh, I guess kind of learn, learn it some more so that we can accurately understand the traditions that we've been inheriting in their full purpose and impact. Okay, I'm through. <laughs> Let's see.